expanding minds and hearts to reach for the reality of heaven. This is Fathom Ministries Podcast. Let's go. Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there he uh, was evening, and there was morning one day. Eddie? Verses 6 through 8. Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let let it separate the waters from the waters. <coughs> God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and, was, and it was so. God called the expanse in heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. All right, Summer? Mm-hmm. Um, 9 through 13. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them and it was so the earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed after their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind and god saw that it was good there was evening and there was morning a third day all right uh susie 14 through 19. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two light, the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. All right, Michael, 20 through 23. And God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. All right, I'll read verse 24 and 25. Then God said... Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. All right, LT 26. Through... 31. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over uh, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit, yeah, yielding seed it shall be a food for you and to every beast of the earth and to every bird in the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life I have given everything uh, no, every green plant for food and it was so God saw that all that he had made and behold it was very good and there was evening and there was morning on uh, the sixth day all right Mr. Eddy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. All right. There's a theory. We'll talk about it later. But there, <clears throat> there's a theory that between verse 1 and 2, Instead of the earth, um, uh, instead of everything being made materially in chaos and then brought into form, the idea is that <clears throat> that uh, it is God creates the whole world perfectly, and then Satan's fall brings it into chaos, and then uh, and then he remakes it. So, first of all, how could anyone know what happened at the beginning of creation, like Genesis suggests? There was nobody to watch it. So, no human ever saw it, and they don't know. How do we know? How did Moses know? Ideas? Okay. And some oral tradition, because that was how they passed it. Exactly. That is the answer to the question. Moses spent 40 days with God twice on the mountain. And therefore, God gave him all of the things that he had put down in the first books of the Bible, what we call the books of Moses. So, uh, he knows because God revealed it to him. Now, as we mentioned in the podcast last week, there are some things he could have known by it being passed down. So God didn't have to teach him probably everything that he knew about it because Adam and Eve told many generations. Remember, they lived a thousand years almost. And so they were around all the way almost up until the flood. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for the generations that saw the flood. So Thinking of something else, too. Um, if Job is the first book of the Bible, like if they... Israelites, if they had copies or a copy of uh, Job's letter before, which it may not have been copied way back then, but it could have been known. You got it, right? Yeah, yeah you guys passed down through. You guys need to know this: that in previous generations, before we had pen and paper, it was not easy to write down anything, and it wasn't easy to preserve it. So, what they did is they memorized it. So in the beginning, what people did is they memorized word for word things because the only pen and paper they had was their brain. And they, they, they didn't know how to write. They didn't know how to use those kind of things. So they would verbatim be able to quote and, and they would carry it around in their head. Okay, and, and so it would be the old sages that would have repeated and repeated and repeated the story so much that they, no, they never showed anybody a Bible or the book of Job, but they would learn these things and they would remember them wrote because before our modern times where writing is easy, this was not the way things were passed down. But that doesn't make that generation ignorant or stupid. They were very good at using their memory. Well, that makes sense. Because even Job's three friends knew about God. Um, exactly. Best advice, but, but they knew about yes. God. Yes, but people memorized these stories. Um, didn't they also do, uh, didn't they also like paint stuff on like sure. walls? Sure, sure. They had, they had all kinds of ways to, uh, 
you know, to engrave different things uh, in, in writing. But writing is a pretty kind of fairly new thing that, you know, did not, uh, uh, didn't, it wasn't like today. It's not like, you know, you've got, I've got writing and paper and printouts everywhere, you know. In those days, they used to write on leather, you know, or papyrus. I guess that wasn't leather. Was that a plant? I'm not sure, but they used parchment was leather, and they would write on those kind of things. So it was it was very uh, meticulous to do these things, and they were much more careful to convey accurately. So, for instance, when they would write copies of scripture, if they made a mistake, they would throw the whole thing out. They wouldn't just er they couldn't erase. And they wanted it perfect, and so they, they really paid attention to every letter, not just every word, every letter. And they, they, were, they, they would make sure that they would not make a mistake. And, of course, they still made copy errors, but there are so few that with all of the old um, material that we've been able to look at, the mistakes are so few that it's incredible how accurate they were in what they did. So that's question number one. How could there be light on day one before the sun was created on day four? Because God on day one created light, but on day four, he created the sun. Think about that question. Tell me what you think if you have an answer. I was going to say, the only way there could be there the only way that there could be light before God created the sun is obviously the light uh, as himself. Because like, cause like you said, that in heaven they don't have a sun. It's the light comes from God. Yes, yes. True. But um, in this case, that, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. But what God did is he made the heavens and the earth, but they were obviously made in darkness. They were not made with light. So the bodies that existed uh, were out there, but none of them were lit up. None of them were light giving. Okay. And so what it's saying is, is that God created light. Now, we live in this universe where the only light we think of is the sun, but we know through... Uh, science that there are greater suns in the universe than ours. So what it's saying is God creating our sun in, in the fourth day was what he created in the fourth day, but he didn't create light for the first time in the universe on the fourth day. Do you understand? So the simple answer to this question is God created, the first thing he creates is light for this universe. Now, what you said would make a lot of sense if God brought that imminent light to the universe, but he did not. It says, and darkness was on the creation. Mm -hmm. Darkness was there. So he created a universe that is in darkness. My theory, and remember, keyword theory here, is I believe like this universe is, uh, you know, bathed in darkness primarily, um, the universe where God is, is the opposite. That is, there's no darkness. It's bathed in light. And it's more than a theory because it's based on the scripture saying there's no need of a sun there. All right. But here, there's many sources of light. There's stars. The moon is a source of light, but it's simply reflecting a light off the sun. Uh, what a great day to talk about that, you know, after the eclipse and all of that. I wish I would have known how massive that eclipse would have, was going to be. I would have went to where it was yeah. because when I saw the video of it and saw how dark it got, I thought, wow, I wish I would have experienced that. I had no, yeah, I, w I had no idea that it was a once in 99 year thing. You know, I would have been there. I would have been working from there to do this, but, um, Nevertheless, um, it was quite awesome. But <clears throat> so that's the answer to that question. So people will foolishly say, oh, yeah, the Bible's so screwed up. It's got light before there's a sun. And that's not screwed up. You don't even have to be very bright to figure that out. You know, yes. I found a scripture a few days ago in Isaiah. Um, that makes sense because the light was just everywhere. God 
put the light into the sun right on the fourth day? What we got to do is step back and say, wait, the universe is much bigger than our solar system. Yeah. And so when God is creating the universe, you know, when you look at how big it is, then he creates light somewhere, somewhere. It may have just been, it, the way I look at this is take the whole universe. We know that even science says that our universe started small and that it expanded, okay? That, and it's ever expanding, it's ever expanding, okay? So if it did start small, that means that God starts it and sometime before, while he's, when he makes it, it starts off dark and then he speaks into it light. Yeah. Which, which light, what light, where? Yeah. He doesn't say. But we know because he doesn't get to our sun for our solar system till day four, that's all that's being said. Yeah. And what's going to be incredible is, is when we get to heaven and we find out exactly when he shows us how it worked, we're going to see that there was no light in the universe. None. Not just our sun and our little solar system. The universe. You know, some of the videos we have show suns that are thousands of times bigger than our sun. Well, they may have existed way before ours existed, right? So all of this is a matter of it. The details are going to be very clear in the future, but now it doesn't really take a lot of brilliance to see this. Yeah, in the scripture. So you just said um, the universe was small, so darkness, but then God spoke light from somewhere. Right. right. This Into this universe. Yeah. The scripture in Isaiah says, I am the Lord and there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness. Yes. I love yes. that. I came across it a couple of days ago. I That's great. I fathom that. Creating light kind of just, I don't know, for me it sounds like putting light into a contained space or like like the, the potter and the clay. Creating darkness, I don't, that's kind of hard yep. to fathom. I don't know. By the way, in line with what you just said, it is dark and light is an additive. He had yeah. to create darkness. He could not have, if, if he would have created it light, you can't, that's why this room is visible because darkness has been driven out. Light is greater than darkness. It is more powerful than darkness. Even John says, God is light and in him there is no darkness. Exactly. So he had to create so when we get to heaven and we see God outside the universe, he created a shell of darkness that when we get to heaven, we're, we're, we're not in that shell anymore. We're in light where it is not a sun that lights it. It is the presence of God that lights it. It emanates. So how could God create the world in six days? The Bible doesn't say that he created the cosmos in six days. If you just paid attention to what you read, it's not saying that. It could be saying that. Or it could be saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here's the condition of the earth. And then God started doing something with it. And so, therefore, there was the first, there was the pre-first day as a matter of fact, you'll notice it doesn't say day one. It says second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. It does not say day one. And that is probably for a reason. Because he first, I believe, he, first he created all of the material universe. But it was chaotic and in darkness. And then he started bringing it form and fullness and purpose so in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth how long did that take it doesn't tell us folks but it does tell us about six days of ordering of that mess that's what it tells us so the key here is to keep that in mind however um there is no demonstrable contradiction of fact between this account in Genesis and, of creation and science. There can only be one thing, a conflict of interpretation. Either bad interpreters on the science side or bad interpretation on the theology side. 
Okay, theology is what we're handling. We're talking about. What does it mean from a theological, from a God-focused teaching? A scientist will say, well, we're going to look at what is, and we're going to tell you what we think based upon the evidence of what we see, what is, okay? So the conflict in Genesis always has to do with interpretation, not the actual scriptures. Now let's talk, I want to talk about the most important thing that has to do with all of this as an umbrella over it all. If you know there's a God, and believe me, you can know there's a God, because to not know there's a God means you're a fool, you're so stupid that you could look at a world like we have and think that it just came together of its own accord. That really takes a high level of stupidity to accept that kind of notion. And, and a simple way that I've heard it explained is, is that if you, wa if you woke up in the morning and in your yard there was a trail of leaves that led from your front door to your car and all of them were placed exactly the same on the ground. Ten, you know, large leaves. Ten leaves across and then ten more and then 10 more, and it led all the way to the door of your car. And there were a couple of leaves sprinkled on top of your car. There is not one sane person who would think for a minute, oh, the wind just blew the leaves there and they just happened to fall. 500 leaves, 10 in a row, all the way from your front door to the car. No, as soon as you saw that, you would know I wonder who did this. It would be axiomatic. It would be simple. I wonder who, 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 put, who put these leaves here. Because you know what? In our life, we've never seen that. And we never will. I also like to point out, no matter what they are, atheists or whatever, they always say when this was created or when this was made. They, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do. Obviously. They do. They slip up on that stuff. That a creator. <laughs> <clears throat> and they're always God damning things, uh, I noticed too. E even though they don't believe in God, I used to uh, have an atheist next to me and I'd say, Why do you keep talking about God? You said you don't believe he exists. <laughs> he goes, Yeah, you're right. I don't know why I do that. All right, so, so here's the point God, I, I, I've known competent people that really know what they're doing. If anyone in the world is competent, it's God. If anyone knows what they're doing, it's God. The switches to make this universe work are so finely tuned that even the atheist scientists tell us that it is so elaborate and complex that there must be millions, if not billions, listen to this, this is today's thinking, of universes like ours for this one to randomly get all the things right that it got right to produce what we have now. And yet there's not another universe that they've ever found, but they've got the theory that there's billions of them because they know that to, they have to keep stretching out the chances of this because as it gets more complex and more complex in their, in their explaining that if, this, if the sun was any closer to the earth, we'd all burn up. If it was any further, we would all freeze to death. And then they've got all these things, one right after another, and they realize there's just no way this could randomly exist. What's hilarious is that they look at you like you're crazy when you say that you think this is the only universe. Like, yeah. Of course it is. But it's funny <laughs> is when you say that you think it was created by God. Then you're the nuts. Where's the evidence? Yeah, where's, <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The most important thing about this is look at the subject of the first line in the Bible, God. So when we're talking about Genesis, of course, the most important thing is what is it about? It's about God. Who created the heavens and the earth? Um, the world, scientists, atheists with the agenda that they don't want or they don't like the idea of God to begin with. They want to disprove God. So all of the premises of their theory 
presupposes there's no need, quote unquote, we don't need a God to explain how we got here. And when I listen to them, and I encourage you, you know, I am not a scientist, but I love listening to the scientists debate each other. And I love to hear the people on our side who are scientists debate the people on that side. And at the end of the day, what I come away with is how ignorant do we have to be to accept the premises that all that is, and we're finding out more and more how much there is to the, uh, the fine tuning of this universe. And all that screams that there has to be intelligent design behind it. And yet they are, they are absolutely in horror of the idea that there is a God. So Genesis answers who created it clearly. There's no ambiguity with the Bible. The heavens and the earth are created by Almighty God, it says. Genesis 1.1 does not, though, answer the question, with what were they created? Science will try to answer that question although they can only go so far, but the Bible does not even once defend what God created the heavens and the earth with. Neither does the Bible defend the existence of God and try to convince you that there is a God. But what Romans says is, is that everyone knows there's a God, for God has put his law in their hearts so that they know he exists. So that means everyone who tells you they don't believe in God, they're even lying to themselves because God has borne witness in their heart. And on judgment day, they will not get a way of standing there saying, but I didn't know you existed because God who put it in there, it's just like the designer of your phone. It'd be like, you know, they design these phones now to where if you drop it in water, it turns colors on the inside so that they know that you dropped it in water. So when you take your phone one week old back to Apple and you say, hey, my phone's not working, they open it up and boom, there's the evidence. You dropped it in water and you're going to say, oh, no, no, I didn't drop it in no water. And they're going to say, yeah, look, we have a little code here and it turns this color whenever it gets wet. And so this is exactly how I envision, although I'm sure it's much more sophisticated than this, but how I envision it will be on Judgment Day when people try to say, or if they were to try to say, they're not going to. They're going to be, they are going to be completely aghast at God and they're not going to try to defend themselves. But if they were to, uh, there would be God saying, wait, let me show you how I made you and where I showed you and how you knew that I existed and you told everybody you didn't believe I existed but you know you were lying that somehow some way he's going to be able to show that that's the case look at this Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 by faith we understand that the worlds the cosmos all right were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are, which are visible. All right, so what did he create it out of? We don't know. But the Bible declares that it was made out of things that are not visible. That doesn't mean, they're, that, doesn't mean that they don't exist in some form, but they aren't visible. God brought out of invisibility the material of the world that, that is created. Well, you know what's shocking? Is that science today actually backs this up and they say there was a time when there was nothing. And then there was this boom. And then out of the universe came this explosion and all this stuff, mass, they call it, mass, comes together. One scientist declared, I forgot his name, but he declared, that he spent 40 years of his life trying to make the case that life could happen in the form it was now out of randomness. And he said after 40 years of intently trying to prove this, he came to the conclusion it was absolutely not possible. Uh, I don't remember the name of the scientist. Now I wanna read this to you out of the New Living Translations. Actually, I'm gonna have Mike read it. Uh, Hebrews 11.3, the same verse we just read, 
New Living Translation. It is by faith we understand that the whole world was made by God's command. So what was so what we see was made by something that cannot be seen. Okay. Now, here is the key. The key is by faith we understand. If you have got to be told how he did it to accept this, then that's where the problem is going to come. Because there wasn't a person there who can tell you. And so, therefore, the scientific method, which is by observation, establishing facts, uh, it can't be established because you can't observe it. There was someone there who observed it. It was God. So we have to either take his word for it by faith. By the way, we take a lot of things by faith. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we get hung up because we'll see a meme or something that someone posts and say, did you know this, this, this? And you're like, wow, I didn't know that. And the truth is, that wasn't even the case. Today, a lot of quotes by people that you admire are not really even real. They'll take someone that's high profile like Bill Cosby or someone like that and they'll say, well, Bill Cosby said, and they'll put in quotes what he said. Well, if you Google it, a lot of times you'll find out he never said it. But when we see the quote and we see the picture of the of the person who said it it seems real you know and it blows our mind whenever we find out that that wasn't ever a quote by that person um so god gives us the information because he was there and since he was there he says that here's how he did it he did it by commanding it so god spoke and it happened well we can't understand that but we can understand how we create. How do we do it? A lot of times we envision what we want to do. We plan what we want to do. When it comes down to actually getting it done, you have to take material that already exists in order to create something new. But God took nothing and made everything material that we see out of nothing. How in the world could we accept that? Only by faith. And that is, where is your faith? In? What is your faith in? If you believe God doesn't lie, he's not trying to fool you, he's not trying to make you believe something that's not true, then on the face of it, you just take, okay, God exists. You look at everything around you, it proves there's a God. Uh, he exists. The Bible is the most fantastic, fantastically put together material over such a vast amount of time and has so much information about God consistently that that is verifiable and information about the future from when it was first spoke to when things happen in the future that it could not have possibly got correct by randomly guessing about it. All of a sudden, pretty soon, you get your confidence in God and in his word and then, by faith, you understand things that you can't other understand otherwise. That is how it works. Uh, Eddie, Psalms 33 and 6. Read that, by please. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their, all their hosts. <sighs> this is really making it personal. You might think, why this language? Well, it's so close to the heart of God in what he's making that... It's wanting you to understand that God, as he breathed out words, because that's how we talk. When we talk, we take a breath and we speak. And the speaking of words is a breathing out of those words. If you could see uh, the vapor that comes from the mouth when, it, when someone speaks, you would see that it's always this air coming in and then someone thinks and then they speak. This is the idea. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He is God, and if he wants something, he simply says it. Jesus had this demonstrated um, in, the, in the Gospels when he was approached by a centurion, which was a soldier commander in the Roman army. And he said, Lord, my son is sick. But he goes like, I understand how things work because I'm a commander. And because I'm a commander, when I want something done, I don't do it myself. I give the command and somebody goes and does it. 
He said, Lord, you don't need to, um, you don't need to come to my house to heal my son. Just say the word and my son will be healed. And Jesus commended this guy for his faith because his faith, his faith was built upon an understanding of how things worked. And he simply, because he knew how his commands worked through people, he knew if he could get to the Son of God and the Son of God would just say, your son be healed, that whatever would heal him, would heal him at his word. Now with people, I can't speak and make something happen. But if, if I can speak and command someone else to do the thing that needs to happen, then my words actually do it. But in this realm, we're working with the limits of human beings. But in God's realm, it's just this. If he speaks anything material, any creature, anything will function exactly the way he commands it to. I'm going to read to you uh, this again to remind us, and then I'm going to do the New Living Translation version. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Here's the New Living Translation. The Lord merely spoke. I love this. The Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word, and all the stars were born. Now, this makes it clear that what he's doing is he's trying to tell you this is how God works. God is so powerful. He's so amazing that he merely spoke and look what he created. And the thing is, you got to understand something. You and I do things accidentally. There is nothing accident about what God did. And down to the most minute detail, when God spoke the world into existence in that second, before that second happened, he knew every ramification of every situation that would happen. That's our God. He is, his knowledge is so superior and perfect that he would know how this word coming out of his mouth to speak the world into existence, he would know there would be an eddy and an LT, and he would know how many hairs were going to be on your head, and he would know everything about you, how you're going to live, how you're going to die, whether you're going to have faith, whether you're not going to have faith, whether you're going to live in heaven, whether you're not going to make it. He would know all of that completely. He would know every single detail of every situation in the world. This is God. huh? And he wouldn't have said it and done it the day that he did if he didn't want that outcome and he wanted a different outcome. So that's why we don't, we don't think of God like we think of ourselves. We learn, we assess, and if we're wise, we make good decisions and we plan well. This is not God. God is perfect knowledge, perfect understanding, perfect comprehension, and perfectly able to look ahead and see what all of the things he's going to do is going, where the dominoes are going to fall and the ones that aren't going to fall. He knows there's no accidents in God. There's no confusion about whether or not it's going to work. It's going to work exactly the way he wants it to work. All right. Uh, Psalms 148, 3 through 5. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you twinkling stars. Praise him, skies above. Praise him, vapors high above the clouds. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord. For Look at this. For Emphasize he, this. For he issued his command, and they came into being. What has being said here? God simply said it. He merely spoke. And all this creation... Psalms 8, 1 through 3. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, you set in place. Okay, so this is someone who's looking at creation and going, wow, God, wow, creator. They're seeing it all purposeful and directly linked to a word spoken. What I'm trying to do right now is show you something, how the scripture is integrated. How, you know, today we have uh, 
uh, hyperlinks when you're in the document. You'll be reading along and there's a hyperlink that takes you to another document that's related to the one you're talking about. Or like when you're on a Kindle and you need to know what a word means, you can you know, click on the word and find a dictionary uh, uh, definition of the word. This is the way scripture is. And so we're going off of Genesis 1.1 and look, look at all the corresponding support that, uh, that follows it. Uh, Eddie, why don't you read this one? Isaiah 45.18. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste Oh. Uh, did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no one else. I am the Lord. Can you imagine God Almighty saying that as his voice thunders over creation? I am the Lord, and there is no one, there is none else. The New Living Translation says of that last phrase, there is no other God. That's what he's saying. There is no other God. And Deuteronomy says, I don't know of any other God. They don't exist. Now here's, here's the power of this. Here God is saying, he created the heavens and the earth. And then it explains. We're talking about the prophet Isaiah, okay? And he's put in parentheses. This isn't my parentheses. This is in the scripture. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. Now, to, to them... Nothing was greater than that. They didn't have telescopes. They didn't know there were planets that were bigger than the earth. They didn't know there were suns larger than our sun. And the truth of the matter is, even without all the telescopes, what is the most impressive thing in the universe? It's earth. I, it's not the biggest, but it is definitely the only one with life. Um, when you look at the earth, it is amazingly different than anything else in the universe. There are plenty of material out there, round balls circling each other <laughs> in darkness and in light, but nothing compares to the earth. And this is saying, Isaiah goes, thus says the Lord. Okay, so he's saying, hey guys, here's what the Lord says. Thus says the Lord who created the heavens. And then he goes, wait, 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 think about this. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. Now, the theory that you mentioned uses this verse to establish their theory of the, uh, that God wouldn't have made the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1-1 to be formless and void because this verse says he did not make it form and void, but he made it to be inhabited. Okay, that is just simply not powerful enough or persuasive enough because all this is saying is, is that he didn't make it to stay that way. What they're doing is they're taking that theory and they're saying, so he couldn't have made the earth in a formless and void condition. And so therefore he must have made it perfect and then something destroyed it. Okay. I, th that's really stretching to make this verse say that. And every time I've ever looked at their theory and I've seen them point to this verse in Isaiah, I'm thinking <clears throat> that is not, even in the context, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is God formed it. So the actual Genesis rendition that we just read in chapter one is about how he formed it, not that he just spoke and it was perfect but he formed it. Plus, it, everything in life follows this same pattern, that it goes from chaos to form. And this is how God does what he does. Jeremiah 10, 12. LT, can you read that one? It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding, he has stretched out the heavens. <laughs> he stretched out the heavens. It talks about his fingers, putting these things in place. This is a God who is actively involved in the creation of his world. And here we're looking at scriptures strung all the way through the Bible, explaining the same vision of creation. Every single prophet has got it wrong if evolutionists have it right. That's what you've got to understand. We're not just talking about Moses in Genesis chapter 1. We're talking, we're spreading this all the way through the whole Bible. Old Testament, 
New Testament. Moses is where the Old Testament starts. Prophets is where it ends up. And then it goes into the New Testament prophets and, and apostles. And all of them say the same thing. This almighty, unbelievable, self-existent God, who is the I am of the universe, he by his wisdom and by his understanding, establish the world as it is. Moses uses the opening verse of Genesis to make certain that we know that the God of Israel is the God of the universe, and it is he who has created all things for himself. That is the point of Genesis chapters 1 through 11, so that you understand later when you get into the little nation of Israel that starts off with this one man basically and his wife and then turns into a nation that this is not a story about someone and their God because in those days they had these idols and they all had different gods there was hundreds and thousands of gods and he had to make sure it wasn't confused as one of the gods that exist but that there were none of them that were actually gods and that the only one that was God is the God that they were talking about. That is the point of Genesis starting where it does. That's why it quickly moves. Israel, the nation, her law and her customs and beliefs, they all go back to who God is. God is righteous. There was a lot of gods that were um, vindictive, uh, there were schizophrenic gods in those days. There were gods that people were trying to appease because they would, they would see disaster and they would think, they would think that the god is angry and, and they didn't know why, but they would have to offer him their children in order to appease him. There were so many ideas floating around about gods in the uh, mythological world out there that it was very important when it comes to the scripture to set this apart as very different than what was bandied about as religion in those days. And anyone who tries to make a connection between this religion and the religion of the mythological gods and uh, the Mesopotamian writings and the gods of Babylonia, there is no connection. There's no, there, there is not even a semblance of sameness when it comes to the basic ethics and principles of the religion of the Bible. What does uh, this imply? It means that everything that exists un must be under God's control, okay? The creation must be in subjection to God, its creator. Um, if something or someone is not apparently subjecting themselves to God, the creator, then God, the creator, must have allowed for this breach and this rebellion for a larger purpose that he has. So when you see people that don't serve God or acknowledge God, or you see a world that's in chaos and it's not living by the principles of God, then you have to understand that if God by definition is God, that he could immediately stop anyone just like our own laws. If, if someone goes on a rampage and starts killing people, what, what do we do? We find out who they are, identify them, and incarcerate them or kill them. That's what happens. If you go kill a police officer, you probably aren't going to live long if you can be identified. Why? Because the government, to operate properly, must subject and enforce its power on its citizens especially those who are not living in compliance with laws that we all accept are good for us as a civil society. And so God has a lot of people living in stark rebellion against him. That either means he can't enforce and make them subject to him, or he has purposely allowed for them to make themselves not subject to him for a period of time. And the period of time is limited and that period of time is going to come to a close and then God has set a day it says that he is going to judge humanity by Jesus Christ and he's going to bring all things subject to him and it says it this way it says all things must be brought that he must reign as king until all things are brought under his feet that means brought completely under his power of subjection that everything aligns with subjection to him completely. So there's not one thing in the universe that is out of step with God's law 
and his rule. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's the important thing we're trying to, <clears throat> trying to see here. Just because something is allowed to breach God's law, his known law and will, does not in any way indicate his lack of the ability to subject that one to himself. The day is coming uh, that he is going to subject them to himself. Listen to this. Summer, Isaiah 45, 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. <laughs> what's, what's striking about this? Look at that close. What is striking about this with regards to everything else that we've read? There's a connection, a very huge hyperlink connection. Doesn't have anybody else greater than himself to swear by. Okay. Read it again. I have sworn by myself. What? What? I have sworn by myself. The Bible says the reason that God swears by himself is because there's no one higher that he can swear by. That's right. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness. And it's not coming back. That to me, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to swear that Jesus is Lord, another verse says. What is the connection? It is in the, the word has gone forth. Remember, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all the verses that I was reading was saying, how did he do it? By the word that came out of his mouth. The breath of his mouth. So it should have been putting this pattern in your mind that, man, when God speaks, worlds are created. All right? So we've studied that God created the universe based on this. Now let's find out something else he said already. Did you hear that? He said already. He already spoke it. He spoke the world. You're on it. You're in it. As a matter of fact, you and you, you have your own world. You have an individual world that you live in, right? Every day when you wake up, you're in your world, right? It centers around you. Yeah. What are you going to eat? What are you going to do? That's your world. Well, guess what? You have a world because somewhere in the past, God spoke this world into existence, put you in it, and let you have the ability to have your own very own world. But he didn't stop there. He already said this. He already said this too. I have sworn. When? Where? I have sworn by myself. The word has gone forth. All right, so everybody you know, God says, he's saying with this, like, please understand, I swear this is true. That's like, that would be the way we would be talking. And I he also myself. is saying not to brag, because he's saying that the word has gone from his mouth in righteousness. He's not just doing this to gloat. No, he's saying this is as... This is as real as when I created everything. He's saying the word's not turning back. Nothing's going to stop this. That to me, every knee is going to bow. So everybody that hates God and says there's no God, they're going to be on their knees because he's, he's said that this is going to happen. And it's a sure, it's all, in other words, it's already set in motion. I mean, I get goosebumps when I think about this because I live in this reality. I believe this. This is something I believe. I believe God is saying something that's true and that he already did. Now, here's the New Living Translation version. And um, Eddie, go ahead and read this one. I have sworn by my own name. I have spoken the truth and I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. Where is that going to happen, guys? The judgment. There's two places it's going to happen. Either at the judgment 
or you're going to do it right now while you have your own will to do so. You want to come to Jesus now? Bow. Swear allegiance to him now. You won't have to be forced to do it later. Right now you have a choice. If you don't take it now, he's not going to force you now. But there's a day coming you're going to be forced. And on that day, it's too late. It won't benefit you except it's, you know why it won't benefit you? Because it's going to be right before you're cast into the lake of fire. You know why it is a benefit? It's because it's going to justify that God was right and you were wrong. That's what it's going to be doing. It's going to say, who's right here? And you're going to get down on your knees and say, you're right. I'm wrong. That's what bowing is. All right, so all of this has already been spoken. So God's right, does he have a right to issue forth law? If indeed God created the universe and the world, in it, it is apparent that he has a right to set forth the laws and govern according to those laws himself, right? If you create a world and you're the God of that world, you have a right to do it the way you want, right? But God says, I don't just do what I want. I do it righteously. I do it right it's good and they will there will be a day every human whoever lives is going to bow and say i agree i i swear you are righteous you did it right you are perfect you are true that's what they're going to do genesis shows that god uses his own creative force to redeem chaos into order that's why i don't like the theory anymore because Genesis actually is showing us this, that the pattern that is very surely shown in Genesis that we just read is that he forms life out of chaos, of an admixture of darkness and formlessness. Darkness becomes light. Curses become blessings. Chaos becomes order. And when you read Genesis, understanding that Moses is intentionally trying to show this pattern over and over. We talked about it in the last lesson. There's the pattern of the fall of Adam. It goes good and then it's bad. There's the pattern of the fall of the human race. There's a flood. It goes horribly bad. One man and, one, uh, one man and his family is saved on the ark. It's a pattern, right? from bad to worse, and then from the flood to the Tower of Babel. Mankind is completely not serving God. As a matter of fact, at the Tower of Babel, one thing that's not said that you must notice is there's no righteous one left. In Adam's case, there's a redemption. In the flood, there's Noah. In the Tower of Babel, there's chaos, and there's not one left. And that's where the scripture says there's none righteous. There's none left. That's no, true. I didn't ever think about that. Yeah. Genesis shows that God's normal method, normal method in this world is to work from the formless chaos to the intricate beauty of design. The six days of creation take twin negatives. What are they? Formlessness? Formlessness is like one time in church, me and mom demonstrated how you could do something formless. And so I, I put a table up. You remember this? And... I got salad material and I had her make a salad and I made a salad at the same time. But when I made my salad, I made it, I just threw a bunch of stuff together. She did it like she's so good at it and made it look really good. She chopped up the lettuce and everything was perfect. While I was making it, I was like, break the lettuce in half, throw it in the bowl, take a tomato, throw it in the bowl. I don't even think you broke it in half. I think you basically put a whole head of yeah. lettuce in formlessness that's the point so what we see in genesis 1 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep he transforms this formlessness in six days into beauty and functionality of design and fullness that's why what is the practical message here wherever you are in your life there's likely to be more formlessness than beauty in terms of God's ideal for you. But this is how he works. He takes you where you're at and he's pulling you along to a particular place. And it's going to be a place of form and beauty and design. Look at this. This is a fantastic illustration. 
What we have here, and I, I'm going to say this, I noticed that in the podcast, sometimes I'm referring to this and it's not being identified exactly what I'm saying. So <laughs> anyone listening would probably be like, wow, I wish I could see what he was pointing at. Okay, so this is the table. And here we have the formless law, uh, raw material on the left, and we have designed function of, fun functionable form on the right. Look what happens here in this form. Day one, light and darkness. It's, it's formless raw material. On day four, days and nights and seasons. He takes what is just light and darkness, useless basically, and he brings form and functionality to it. On day two, there's the sea and there's the sky, but it's not serving the purposes it's, it's made for. It's just raw material. Over here on day five, a suitable abode per, uh, formed perfectly for birds of the air and for fish of the sea. This is God's pattern. Day three, land. What good is land buried in an ocean of water? Not too much. But on day six, the land brings forth fertile land, suitable for growing food for both man and beast. So for the man and the beast to live, he brings design, form, function. And then day seven, the most beautiful of days, because it's the day that God rests, showing that it was not just for God that he was illustrating a day of rest, but also that he had a goal for the whole creation that in the end, the end game plan was to bring the beauty of form and function and let go of all of the bad. That's God's plan. That's what Moses is trying to make clear. That's what Genesis 1 through 11 is about. Even the pattern of the biblical day starts off the same way in this pattern. Evening marks the beginning. Darkness is coming on the land. Morning. We read it just now together. And it was evening. And it was morning. The first day. The second day. So on. Genesis 1, 5. And there was, every, there was evening and there was morning one day. And then it said that every day. For six days. <clears throat> the same darkness to light pattern holds true uh, even in our lives. Summer, read Ephesians 5.8. This is out of the Good News Bible. You yourselves used to be in the darkness. Look at that. Darkness. You guys, please don't miss this. This isn't just accidentally paralleling with Genesis. This is why I've been telling you ever since I've been speaking is you got to know Genesis to even understand the rest of the Bible. There's types and patterns in Genesis that run all the way through it. And so this is by design. As a matter of fact, the very design of the world with light and darkness is so God could make this clear in the way that he's doing it here. Go ahead. Read it again. You yourselves used to be in the darkness, but since you have become the Lord's people, you are in the light. So you must live like people who belong to the light. There it is. The pattern. Darkness, light. Darkness, light. The darkness, if you have darkness in you, God is trying to get that out of you. If you have light in you, the Bible teaches that if you let the light shine, it will become ever brighter, ever brighter. You will become more clearly understanding of the principles of righteousness and truth and light, okay? Um, that darkness is defined as a metaphor of evil is shown here in Ephesians 6, 12. Mike, would you read that? Good News Bible. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. I was telling you about that earlier, Eddie to where that's what's going on in our world right now. And we think it's these people and these riots and these, you know, all these crazy people out there. But the truth of the matter is there is a thing in the, in the background that is an evil force. And it's saying that it's darkness. And that darkness has, has power. And that power is actually destroying people. You know, we see it every day. People are running over people on sidewalks. People are just doing the craziest things today. And all of that is not only the human beings that are involved. We're not fighting against just human beings here, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world. Um, one, as far as like that goes, uh, one really good saying that I've heard is like the whole, um, 
darkness thing that everybody has that they go through in their time in their life. It, it's only temporary, but like the more you let it in, the more it basically has hold of you. And stuff. Right, and it's 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 tempor. It's only temporary if you find God. Yeah. It's permanent if you don't, because you'll 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 live in darkness and you'll die in darkness and you'll be in eternal darkness. So it's it's not really temporary unless you find the Lord, and then it's temporary. Well, I am out of time tonight, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I thank you so much. I hope, most importantly, I think we've done enough on the scripture side here to demonstrate this pattern that exists in Genesis. You've been listening to a Fathom Ministries podcast with me, Pastor Nathan Reynolds. You can find more podcasts and contact info at our website at www.fathomministries.org Thank you for listening. I hate living without you Dead wrong to ever doubt you But my demons lay in wait and tempted me Without an oh